FBI Director Christopher Wray warning Congress this week that, quote, China's hackers are positioning on American infrastructure in preparation to wreak havoc and cause real world harm. That's right after the U.S. government disrupted a large botnet of malware installed by the Chinese government on U.S. routers. And in the past month, we've seen a big run-up in cybersecurity stocks, including names like CrowdStrike and Palo Alto. Here to discuss is CrowdStrike CEO George Kurtz. George, welcome. What do you make of this warning from the FBI director wreaking havoc on U.S. infrastructure? Well, I think what we're seeing is the serious nature of this, uh, to have the FBI come out and actually warn against this particular threat, uh, I think um, shows the level of capability that China has, and I think the level of concern the U.S. government actually has uh, in this pre-preparation phase uh, before a potential invasion of Taiwan, and that's really what this is all about, and that's the level of concern that we're seeing here. So when we think U.S. critical infrastructure, we think what, water, gas, electric, how vulnerable are we? Well, this is one of the things that um, we've seen over many years is that critical infrastructure, certainly in the U.S., most of it is not owned by the U.S. government. And it has and continues to be one of the areas of concern and vulnerability. When you look at the level of security in some of the organizations, um, there's certain standards that they're trying to adhere to, but many of these systems, these operational technologies, OT, are old, antiquated, and very difficult to upgrade. So they become even more vulnerable to attack and disruption by the likes of what we call Vanguard Panda, the Chinese government. So who do you think this message was for from the FBI director? And who needs to heed it? In general, what I would say is critical infrastructure needs to heed this, but cybersecurity is more than just critical infrastructure. And I think this warning is a public warning, um, given what we're seeing in this operational preparation of the environment, OPE. This is really the pre-positioning phase before something happens. And as we know, China has been very patient, but they have made it clear that Taiwan is of interest to them. So I think what we're seeing here is the U.S. government saying, hey, we've got a problem here critical infrastructure and the private sector need to come together to be able to identify and disrupt the Chinese government from taking these pre-positioned activities before something happens in the future. Do you have a view, George, when I mean, we talk about the different silos of risk regarding water treatment and the grid and natural gas and oil production, do you, do you think that there's any asymmetry within that? Is one mo more at risk than the other? Well, you have to step back and you have to look at really what is the intention here, and it's to disrupt the logistics. So if Taiwan, if the U.S. was to be drawn into a, a war with Taiwan, we've spent billions and billions of dollars to have the capabilities to be able to engage. If those capabilities disrupted from a logistical perspective, the oil, the gas, the ammunition, if it can't get to where it needs to be, everything today is run on the network. And if we don't have those capabilities, what better way to disrupt without actually even sending a, a missile somewhere, right? If you engage in a kinetic uh, type warfare, obviously you know who it is, and that increases the escalation between the two countries. But if you can hide behind an anonymous, anonymous botnet like the KV botnet, which was actually disrupted, it, there's some level of, of, of shielding that takes place where it's good, not, not really going to engage the U.S. To, to be drawn into something because of the anonymity. Is it right. really China? Is it not? It's hard to prove. But from a cyber perspective, we know they've been involved in these sort of activities. It's almost it's, it's like a, a proxy of a proxy war, uh, which obviously makes the response uh, a lot more difficult to, to figure out. Absolutely. And that's why cyber has been such an effective tool, not only for network reconnaissance, for data theft, we've talked about on your show many times, the Chinese and stealing this data, but the ability to actually disrupt and de degrade capabilities, um, it's the perfect cyber weapon uh, to be able to do that. So what, how, how, are you, how are you inserting yourself in this? Is it, is it pitches to infrastructure companies, to the government, to, the enter to private sector companies in, in anticipation of increased activity from the Chinese? I would say it's two things. We've been involved in the public-private partnership for many years, uh, and in particular around this threat. We've tracked Vanguard Pandas since 2020, and we've actually been able to uh, disrupt some of their uh, activities in customers of ours. So 
this is something that, from an intelligence perspective, uh, the public and the, the private uh, companies need to come together with the government to be able to share this intelligence and to be able to um, equip and arm our critical infrastructure and, and make sure that they have a level of resiliency to be able to stand up to these attacks. So it's part of what yeah. we do every day at CrowdStrike. We've seen it, we've disrupted it, we've detected it, and that's what we're gonna to continue to focus on from a customer perspective. And you mentioned the botnet. We talked about Eamon Javers, who covers this for us, did a lot of reporting on this, and he was explaining that, you know, getting into home routers across the country. What, what Have you learned about what the Chinese were trying to accomplish here? Sure, so when you look at these home routers and, and many other types of equipment like this, uh, and this is something Director Easterly and I have talked about for, for many years, is that these types of equipment, um, they tend to age out. At some point, they're just not worth upgrading from the, the manufacturer's perspective. So the software gets old, it's not upgraded, it's vulnerable, and it's the perfect tool and um, uh, operating system to be able to have the Chinese attack. They can hide in the background, they can easily get into these routers, and they can commandeer them for this anonymous botnet. So essentially what was done here was this botnet was was uh, interrupted, but it doesn't mean that the Chinese are going to go away. They're going to find other capabilities and other ways to anonymize their attacks. Got it. That was George Kurtz, the CEO of CrowdStrike, stating that more cybersecurity is needed for our critical infrastructure here in the U.S. Uh, China is certainly a threat, but you also have to add a few other countries on the list. North Korea. Russia, Iran possibly also has a, I'm sure they have a cyber, um, you know, hacking unit. Um, Ru North Korea in particular, I saw a video a few years ago on a hacker army. And so just wanted to bring you a clip about that. And then I'll get into the technical analysis of the stocks, the cybersecurity stocks afterwards that were discussed in the video. Entertainment is reeling from what may be the biggest and most devastating computer hacking in Hollywood's history. Hackers attacked in waves, first crippling Sony's internal systems, then leaking five Sony movies online. Today, the U.S. government pointed the finger of blame directly at North Korea for the devastating cyber attack against Sony Pictures. Sony pulling the plug on the interview, saying it will not show the controversial comedy about an assassination attempt on North Korea's leader, the Sony Pictures hacking was taken very seriously because it was an attack on the free world. What we have been building in terms of our civilization and our freedom and our ability to exchange information freely had been disrupted by a country that we knew very little about. North Korea has reportedly made attempts to steal COVID-19 vaccine technology by hacking pharmaceutical giant Pfizer. The Justice Department has charged three North Korean hackers over a wide-ranging scheme that included the attempt theft of billions of dollars from multiple companies. Despite so many attacks blamed on North Korea, there was not much known about the people behind the hacking attacks. And my aim was to reveal who these people are what they are like, what their operations are like, and on what their dreams and fears were. So that was just a short clip. And if you want to see more of that, you can do a quick search on YouTube for North Korean hacker army, and you'll probably be able to see a hell of a lot more. Um, anyway, let's get into the charts. Let's get into these charts now. We're going to take a look at CrowdStrike. Uh, the ticker, then there's another company called um, Global X Cybersecurity. We've got Checkpoint Software Technologies, um, CyberArk Software Limited, iHack. We're going to look at the Russell 2000 because I forgot to do a video on that in the prior video uh, with Tom Lee. And also Palo Alto Networks. Okay, so let's take a look at Let's start with... CrowdStrike, since that was the company um, that was mostly discussed in the interview. All right, let's take a look first. Let's look at the weekly charts. Looking at this, um, you can see what's happened. We had prior highs here at the three around the three hundred dollar level. This is, goes back all the way to twenty twenty one, right? Uh, and uh, we have reached that those highs, and we have actually surpassed them. 
um, we are basically, as you can see, breaking through that. This last week, we finally broke through that level that went back to 2021. Now, um, one other important thing I wanted to share. So on this chart that you're seeing here, we have CrowdStrike. It's showing the prior earnings announcement here. Uh, you could see that back in 2023 Q3, November 28th, right? That was the last earnings date. Uh, we had a surprise of 10.45% on the earnings per share. On the earnings per share, GAAP, 155.22% surprise. And on revenue, there was a 1.12% surprise. Now, this is a $72 billion, almost $73 billion company, but their income was negative and profit margin has been negative but has been really performing well. I mean, for the last year, for the last 12 months, 100, it's up 174.72%. Performance year to date, it's up 18.9%. Earnings, the sales are increasing, so that's good, right? We see quarter to quarter growth here. Sales quarter to quarter is 35.21%, and uh, sales over the past five years, 70, up 73.69. But they they really need to work on their operating margin and profit margins here. They also have a negative price to free cash flow, as you can see right there. Um, it looks like they're also increasing their shares uh, outstanding here. So that's also not a necessarily a, a positive thing. Okay, so we looked at the, the weekly. Let's take a look at the daily chart. Here you can see it's been stuck in this area, right? But it's starting to move back up. Uh, we can, if we take a close look here at the directional movement it is positive to get the plus di line above the negative di line which is important and but the adx is still moving down all right so that's something to to watch out for okay let's go to the next stock we're going to start with a weekly chart on on global x cybersecurity. so on the weekly chart we're coming close to a resistance level of 32 dollars so that's uh, something to be concerned about. And we also have some reversal candles that are forming here. Not necessarily the ideal place um, on the weekly chart. And then on the daily, we're also below the Tengensen, but we are above the Kijensen. So it's just kind of flattening out here. All right. We also had some negative volume on Friday. Okay. Let's take a look at the next. It was down 1.02% on Friday. Next one is Checkpoint Software. This one looks really strong. I mean, you can see above also the fundamentals are looking pretty good. Their next earnings announcement, though, is on February 6th, right? That's going to be, you know, on Tuesday. So is I, would, I certainly wouldn't be buying right before the earnings announcement. I'd wait until after the earnings and then maybe look and see how the, the company uh, performed in their earnings. And then, you know, take some time to digest that information before going long. But, I mean, it's it's been ultra strong for so long, for you know for quite a while now this uptrend if we look at it on the weekly chart uh it broke through where you know we're experiencing new highs here this all started happening once we broke that level right there the level of 150 dollars and the adx is still strong on the weekly and on the daily also strong you can see the adx is moving up and everything's looking good let's look at the next one on the weekly chart cyber arc software limited very strong also has uh like similar to the crowdstrike um negative profit margins their next earnings are just february 8th also very close to right you know this month um sales growth has been good and uh, i mean i like the chart it looks good but i'd wait until after the february 8th honestly to consider entering a position in this I like the charts. They look good. Let's take a look at the next one. Weekly chart on the iHack. All right. This is the an ETF, iShares Cybersecurity. So if you want diversification in um, these uh, cybersecurity stocks, right, this is the way to go. Now, one cool thing I'll show you is uh, when we look at the component list, it consists of, you know, about 21 different stocks, right? So... You can see Akamai is one of them. You know, there's CrowdStrike. You know, there's, there's a whole bunch of stocks that are in there. So um, it's just a way to diversify. If you don't want to hold just one position, uh, iHack might be the way to go. All right. So something to think about now. On the weekly chart, looks 
strong, except that it's coming close to the 49.15 level, which is that prior high there. And on the daily chart, I like what I'm seeing. It uh, actually, for two days now, it's been above the Tenkinson. This is a really nice price setup, actually, in my opinion. Uh, I like what I'm seeing. Anyway, all right, let's take a look at PANW. PANW is Palo Alto Networks. This company, let's look at the weekly chart, also very strong. This one actually has profit, uh, positive profit margins, 8.52%. Their next earnings are on February 20th. Sales growth, 23.5. Um, the price of sales is a little high, but it's, it's performing really well. Let's look at the daily chart on that one. This is a great um, trading setup as well. I like this one because it just literally popped above the tank uh, on Friday. And it was up on one, like basically 1 1.5%. So I like that. All right. Now, since we didn't cover the Russell 2000 in the prior um, in the prior video, because it was discussed, uh, Tom Lee talked about it. Let's take a look at the Russell 2000. Okay, so I want you to pay attention to a very critical level here. It's basically these this level here, the $200 level basis, it's around the 200, 201 level. Multiple times where price has come here, like once here back on um, August 19th, 2022. Once again, February 3rd, 2023. Here we are again, August 4th, 2023. And recently, the high there on December 29th of 2023, and then it retra retraced, it came back, it pulled back, and it's come. It's still holding onto this level. Um, I do like the fact that it, it's starting to, to move back up again, though. So like it came down, found support right on the Tenkinson, the green line, bounced a little bit right there, created a, a bullish candle. Now on Friday, though, it was down 0.53%, and it's, so it's finding resistance once again. That's where we're at on the weekly chart. So like, personally, I'd want to see price close above, you know, like a high of like maybe the that high right there of 205, that most recent high. And if we get a closing price above there, then I think that's what's going to be the catalyst that's going to make this ETF and the Russell 2000 start to really take off, okay? I also feel similarly to Tom Lee that once the interest rates uh, are cut by the Fed, that's also going to help to, you know, um, boost the interest in Russell 2000 stocks because they're going to be able to borrow money at much, you know, at a cheaper rate. It's going to help the smaller and mid-sized companies. Now let's look at the daily chart. Daily chart is, you can see it more clearly here, those levels, those weekly levels, right? It's come right down. Now Tenkinson is under the Kijunson. That's a negative right there. It crossed under there back on uh, January 16th. It's stayed under there, but look what's happening. Found support here on Thursday, February 1st came down, touched it, and buyers came in. Uh, the next day, Friday, price gap down, okay, and then it started moving up. You could see it clearer, more clearly on the on the, on the the uh, five-minute chart. There's that gap down, and then buyers came back in, but they didn't want to get above the prior day's closing price, right? And they it dropped, it was like down 0.53%. So, um, yeah, that's the situation. Anyway, guys, if you uh, like this video, go ahead and uh, subscribe and like. Appreciate it. Thanks for all the likes. I appreciate them. And I'll catch you all in the next video.